Welcome to part two of the ups and downs of neuroendocrine system. I will be your presenter today. My name is Donna Avenisian. I am a nurse practitioner working in neuro-oncology. I work at Hartford Healthcare Medical Group and Cancer Institute at Hartford Healthcare. And I welcome and thank you for attending today's presentation. I have nothing to disclose. Part two will focus on fluid and sodium regulation. The objectives, again, are to identify the hormones secreted by the pituitary gland and their action. We will be more specifically concentrating on the posterior lobe of the pituitary gland. And I'm going to be describing the pathophysiology management and treatment for patients with SIDH, cerebral salt wasting, and central diabetes insipidus. Please feel free to attend part one, where I'll be discussing the pathophysiology management and treatment for patients with growth hormone deficiency in excess, adrenaline insufficiency, and Cushing syndrome. To review briefly, I'm going to go over the anatomy and physiology of the pituitary gland. So as we mentioned in part one, the pituitary gland is a pea-sized gland that's located in a protective bony structure known as the cella turcica, which is located at the base of the skull. Um, it's connected to the hypothalamus by in the infant dubulum, which is also known as the pituitary stalk. And this allows communication between the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus. There are two lobes comprising the pituitary gland, both an anterior lobe uh, which is known as the adenohypophysis and a posterior lobe, which is known as the neurohypophysis. This is a cross-sectional cartoon uh, demonstrating the anatomy. Again, you have anterior lobe, posterior lobe of the, post of the pituitary gland. You have your pituitary stalk and your hypothalamus. This is a closer view of that same um, demonstration. And on this side, we have the pituitary gland sitting in the cella turcica, and there is, um, as you can observe, a pituitary mass uh, impinging on the lobe. In reviewing the anterior lobe real briefly, we have somatotropes, corticotropes, thyrotropes, gonadotropes, and lactotropes. Somatotropes are responsible for the secretion of human growth hormone, which stimulate growth of bone, cartilage, and muscle, Corticotropes um, secrete adrenal corticotropin, which stimulates glucocorticoids and mineral corticoids. And uh, both of these are responsible for androgen production by the adrenal cortex. Thyrotropes secrete thyroid stimulating hormone, which stimuli stimulate synthesis and secrete thyroid hormones. Gonadotropes, the gonadotropic hormones secreted include luteinizing hormone, follicle stimulating hormone, which in turn stimulate growth and maturity and responsible for normal functioning of primary and secondary organs. And finally, we have lactotropes, which secrete prolactin. Prolactin stimulates the growth of mammary tissue and promotes lactation. Again, um, in reviewing the posterior lobe, so here we are, here's the posterior lobe, direct com communication with the hypothalamus. It contains magnocellular neurosecretory cells that are synthesized actually by the hypothalamus and then are stored in the posterior lobe. Now, we'll now begin to direct our attention to today's discussion, which is fluid and sodium regulation. We can't have this discussion without a brief review of osmolarity. Now, osmolarity, by definition, is the concentration of fluid affecting water movement among fluid partitions. And the osmolarity is determined specifically by serum sodium concentration. A normal serum sodium concentration, as we all know, is anything between 135 to 145 milliequivalents per liter. Hyponatremia is considered to be anything less than 135 milliequivalents per liter. And hypernatremic state is considered to be a serum sodium of greater than 145 milliequivalents per liter. Now, osmolarity measures the concentration of fluid per kilogram of fluid 
and it's essential for assessing and monitoring hydration status. And the normal serum osmolarity is anywhere from 275 to 295 milliosmoles per kilogram. Normal at levels are maintained by free to water intake and excretion in the awake patient and is specifically driven by a patient's thirst and fluid intake. The formula for calculating the serum osmolarity is two times the serum sodium plus glucose divided by 18 plus the BUN divided by three will give you a serum sodium level. We'll now begin our discussion on the neurohypophyseal regulation of antidiuretic hormone. Now, antidiuretic hormone is also known as arginine vasopressin. And ADH uh, release is managed by plasma osmolarity and arterial baroreceptors located both in the carotid sinus as well as in the aortic arch. If there are any small changes that take place in serum osmolarity, blood volume, and arterial receptor, uh, sorry, and arterial receptors, there is the release of ADH through vasopressin receptors, which are located in the arterial walls collecting ducts of the kidneys, as well as in pituitary tissue. Now, thirst mechanism. The thirst mechanism is stimulated by increased in, in extracellular fluid osmolarity or decreased intravascular volume. That's what will start our thirst mechanism in the awake patient to begin to work. So let's talk a little bit more about sodium disturbances. So we've already mentioned that a serum sodium of less than 135 is considered to be hyponatremia. In hyponatremia, serum sodium is considered to be greater than 145, but we'll be speaking a little bit more about this. Today's lecture is specifically going to be focused on SIDH, which is the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone, which is the disorder in which abnormal water retention and excessive electrolyte excretion occur, which results in hypotonic, hyponatremia, and increased total body water. Not to be confused with cerebral salt wasting, which is also a hyponatremic and hypovolemic state, which is caused by an increased excretion of urinary sodium. And it's seen frequently in patients presenting with aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage. Diabetes insipidus is a clinical syndrome of water imbalance where there is either a reduction in the amount of ADH made or distributed with, or, and it's seen also with an impaired kidney response resulting in excessive dilute urine excretion, also known as polyuria. And finally, polydipsia. Polydipsia is a clinical syndrome by which the patient exhibits compulsive and excessive water intake. And this is considered to be anything greater than five liters in a 24 hour period. This will then lead to expansion and dilution of body fluids. Now we can further break down hyponatremia by various conditions. So hyponatremia, there are three types. There is the mild, which is a serum sodium of 130 to 135, moderate 125 to 130 and severe, anything less than a serum sodium of 124. So we'll begin with hypovolemic hyponatremia. Now there are multiple causes. There are renal causes, extrarenal causes, and cerebral salt wasting. So let's look further on renal causes. Renal causes can include diuretics, salt wasting nephropathy, and this can be seen in patients with chronic renal failure and interstitial nephritis. Osmotic diuretics can also lead to hypovolemic hyponatremic state and aldosterone deficiency. Extrarenal causes of hypovolemic hyponatremia include volume replacement with hypotonic fluids, GI losses such as diarrhea and vomiting, GI fistulas, and third space loss that you see in patients with burns and patients with pancreatitis. And finally, cerebral salt wasting, which is also classified as hypovolemic hyponatremia. The second type of hyponatremia is hypervolemic hyponatremia. And this has multiple causes as well, including renal failure, 
whereby there's an inability to excrete water, congestive heart failure, feedback loop to the kidneys perceives a low flow state that is seen in congestive heart failure, which then leads to ADH production. Cirrhosis can lead to a hypervolemic, hyponatremic state, and finally, nephrotic syndrome. The last type of hyponatremia is called euvolemic hyponatremia. As with the other types, there are many causes, including hypothyroidism, adrenal insufficiency, medications, including morphine, barbiturates, NSAIDs, certain anticonvulsants, such as carbaminazepine and oxcarbazine. And finally, SIDH is classified as a euvolemic hyponatremic condition. Now, there are also various types of hyponatremia. So you have hyponatremia with hypovolemia caused by extra renal losses from vomiting, diarrhea, and burns, renal losses from medications uh, such as uh, both loop and osmotic diuretics. You also can have hyponatremia with hypovolemia caused by hypertonic saline solutions, TPM, and the administration of IV sodium bicarb. There is diabetes insipidus, which also can lead to hyponatremia. And there's both a primary and secondary types of diabetes insipidus. Causes central neurogenic failure, such as seen as in hypothalamic and, um, uh, damage, which may be due to either a head injury, iatrogenic injuries during surgery, tumors, mass effect from uh, increased intracranial pressure. There are nephrogenic conditions that can lead to diabetes insipidus. There is also um, primary or family central DI and gestational conditions that can lead to diabetes insipidus. So let's look at data assessment in a patient presenting with hyponatremia. Now, various symptoms, various appearances, but usually it's going to be dependent upon how severe the hyponatremia is, whether or not the hyponatremia is a chronic condition versus an acute condition. Because patients with chronic hyponatremia may be completely asymptomatic, and it's a, um, a finding on routine um, CMP or basic uh, metabolic uh, panel. Uh, in patients with SIAT, IT, the, sorry, SIDH, um, you're going to want to obtain a history regarding um, if there's any other medical conditions. So patients with um, uh, cancers of the lung can also present with SIDH. And um, as I've reviewed before, there are certain medications, uh, including some of the AEDs that can lead to SIDH state. But some of the symptoms that are commonly seen, uh, altered level of consciousness, um, you want to hear whether or not the um, alteration in level of consciousness was gradual. Um, is there any confusion, agitation, seizures? If the serum sodium is low enough, low enough they may actually present with seizure activity as their uh, chief medical complaint. Nausea and vomiting, commonly seen, lack of appetite is also commonly seen in patients with hyponatremia. They may also complain of muscle weakness and even a headache. Diagnostic studies, you're gonna to wanna to perform a serum sodium. Um, I would perform a complete metabolic panel. You wanna obtain serum osmolarity, urine light, urine osmolarity, full thyroid panel, including TSH, uh, T3 and T4. And of course, if you order your complete metabolic panel, you'll get your renal function uh, results uh, within those results as well. Diagnostic criteria for SIDH, plasma hypoosmolality. So uh, anything less than 275 milliosmoles per kilogram. Inappropriately concentrated urine. So greater than 100 milliosmoles per kilogram but usually higher than the serum osmolarity. A urine serum sodium of grace, greater than 40 milliequivalents per liter, normal adrenal, renal, and thyroid function, 
The BMP is usually within normal limits. There is notable decreased urine uh, output when compared to intake. And they also may have increased body weight anywhere between five to 10%. Management of SIDH includes uh, fluid restriction, specifically with free water. Um, restriction parameters is usually less than 1,000 milliliters per 24 hour. If unable to fluid restrict, you can then consider the following. Diuretic administration. Um, you can actually give hypertonic saline solution. Administration of ADH antagonists, such as de uh, demeclocycline uh, hydrochloride. Um, administration of Vaptans, uh, which is a, a vasopressin V2 receptor antagonist. Um, there are newer classes of agents in oral and IV formulations, which actually will promote free water excretion and are considered as a possible treatment option for SIDH if all else fails. In managing hyponatremia, you always want to consider underlying causes of hyponatremia. And of course, this is in excluding those individuals who have been diagnosed with SIDH. In patients with chronic hyponatremia, um, they must be corrected very slowly. Um, and this is to avoid osmotic demyelination syndrome, which is also known as central pontine myelinolysis. And this occurs when there's too rapid of a shift of water from brain cells as seen in the treatment with hypertonic saline. So you do need to be very, very careful in treating patients with chronic hyponatremia. The serum sodium, should not be increased more than uh, 0 0.5 per, uh, sorry, 0 0.5 to one milliequivalents per liter per hour with a maximum of eight to 10 milliequivalents per liter in a total of 24 hours. We'll now shift our attention to cerebral salt wasting. So cerebral salt wasting, you know, these symptoms are gonna be very dependent upon the serum sodium level. So the degree of change in level of consciousness, lack of appetite, nausea, vomiting, and all of that is really going to be very dependent upon how low that salt uh, sodium level is. Objectively, you know, as with uh, mentioned before, you have alteration in level of consciousness, confusion, muscle weakness, and seizures if serum sodium is low enough. And I've seen uh, patients present with serum sodiums of 119, uh, but presenting with um, generalized tonic-clonic seizure. Diagnostic studies, uh, again, serum labs, including serum and urine uh, sodium. And in these cases, you really want to look at that serum and urine osmolarity. And um, the urine sodium, as well as the urine osmolarity, is going to help in making this uh, diagnosis. Diagnostic criteria, decreased serum sodium, with a urine sodium of greater than 40 milliequivalents per liter, high evidence of hypernatremia. And in this case, the BMP is going to be increased. Management of cerebral salt wasting includes treating the underlying cause and severity, having a keen knowledge of the volume status required and correcting the sodium very slowly. So it should not be decreased more than 0 0.5 to, uh, to one milliequivalent per liter per hour with again, a maximum of eight to 10 milliequivalents per liter in a 24 hour period. So again, this, the, the correction must be accomplished very, very slowly. Central DI. So in patients with diabetes in, uh, insipidus, they're usually going to have an increased in urinary output and increased thirst. They may exhibit signs of dehydration. Changes in level of consciousness can also be observed. The key here with diabetes is, uh, insipidus is that they are unable to compensate for free water loss. They're never going to be able to intake the enough, enough fluids or the amount of fluids to compensate for their free water loss. Objectively, you're going to see shifting, fluid shifting out of the intracellular compartment leading to brain dehydration. The patient may exhibit irritability, cognitive dysfunction, disorientation, change in level of consciousness, seizures, 
focal neurological de de uh, deficits, coma, you may also observe tachycardia, hypotension, hypovolemia, and even shock if left untreated. Diagnostic studies include obtaining a serum osmolarity, urine sodium, urine specific gravity, and a BMP. Diagnostic criteria, you're gonna see uh, there's presence of polyuria ranging anywhere from four to 10 liters per 24 hours with an hourly output of greater than 200 milliliters. Hypotonic urine, urine osmo is usually less than 200 milliosmoles per liter. Urine specific gravity can be uh, anywhere from 1.000 to 1.005 and a serum osmolarity of greater than 300 milliosmoles per kilogram. How do we manage central DI? Well, there's a two-pronged approach in correcting hypernatremia. There's a need for replacement of ADH to prevent ongoing renal water loss and fluid resuscitation to compensate for the water loss. Now, if there's an intact thirst drive, you wanna encourage fluids if unable to take oral fluids, then you're gonna really need to replace IV fluids uh, for sure. And you may also do a combination of both. As far as medications are concerned, administration of DDABP, which is vasopressin analog, and it can either be administered intranasally, intravenously, and there are even oral formulations. Usually the um, intranasal is uh, commonly used. You wanna make sure that there is strict intake and output, and this can be accomplished even on the outpatient uh, basis. And the medication adjustments are made according to the patient's uh, urinary output. And in patients with chronic um, cerebral diabetes uh, or central uh, diabetes insipidus, uh, there's gonna need to be long-term follow-up with endocrinology. This concludes our discussion on disorders of fluid and water balance. I hope you have enjoyed this two-part series and I wish you all the best of luck. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact me directly at donna.avenesian at hhc.org.